Hello and uh, good morning everyone. I am Eleni and I'm here with Professor Maya Rupnik. Maya is a professor at the National Laboratory of Health, Environment and Food in Slovenia, the Department for Microbiological Research. And she also works in the University of Maribor in the Faculty of Medicine. Welcome Maya, good to have you here with us. Hello everybody, glad to be with you. So without further ado, I will go and ask you my first question for today, which is about your research. So can you tell us a few words on what you're currently investigating? Well, our main research basically currently goes into two main uh, areas. One is uh, Clostridioides uh, difficile, because Clostridium was renamed recently. And the other part of our research is uh, microbiota, mainly gut microbiota, but also other parts of the human body. Your talk today is going to be about Clostridium clostridioides. Clostridioides, but oh, Clostridium is still okay. Yeah. I didn't hear that the name was changed, so yeah, about uh, the pathogen and One Health. So it's it's a very interesting topic, and to be honest, I've, I've heard those terms separately a lot of times, uh, but never together, so I want to ask you if you can give us um, a brief summary of what you're going to talk later today. Yes, this is basically um, the the main idea of the talk is to show you that Clostridium difficile is a one health problem. And a lot of uh, Clostridium difficile epidemiology is actually happening on the transborder region between humans and animals and environment. So I will be talking about this and uh, I will be also uh, showing you that uh, when you go to this transboundary area, there are quite some of surprises that uh, waiting for one. So very unusual strains or very unusual places where you can find the bug. So if we specify now into the One Health concept, uh, how important in your opinion is to implement the One Health concept into society and perhaps into dealing with pandemics? The interesting fact with uh, One Health is actually that uh, this is a very old idea, but was uh, rediscovered only recently. And uh, we have just found that uh, we need different approaches to solve the complex health problems. And uh, one of the things that uh, I see now as an important uh, feature of One Health is that field is slowly moving from this traditional combination of veterinary and medical medicine, so human medicine, and is covering more and more uh, disciplines and more and more sectors. And uh, with this being said, we really need to develop the ways how we will start to learn about each other and how we will start to understand each other. For instance, how the microbiologist will understand somebody who is working in ecology or in wastewaters or in uh, social sciences because this everything needs to work together somehow to get the best solutions so i think this collaboration and uh, mutual learning is now the the main challenge for one health the collaboration aspect is also very, very important in general. And as we've seen uh, with uh, how we deal with the pandemic, the collaboration between different disciplines is also very important to achieve what we want to. So different sectors cannot work independently. We have to have collaboration and with collaboration comes communication. So how to communicate between the different departments, because if you say something scientific to someone that doesn't know a lot about it, then something is lost in translation. So I agree a, a lot about the, your answer here. With, with the pandemic, a lot of things, as well, as we said, had to, um, to go online. And um, I mean, how do you find the online world? And in your opinion, what are the pros and cons of being online? Yeah, online is a strange place. So uh, we all had the um, uh, time window of uh, adaptation. Yeah. 
But now I think most of us really adapted to it and there are a lot of uh, positive things. One funny positive thing is, for instance, that uh, everybody see the slides very clearly oh, yeah. because you see them on your computer. And uh, another very positive thing is that a lot more people actually attend to the conferences from a lot more countries that this would usually happen which is great, but what I'm missing and what I'm finding very, very strange is, you know, when the talk is over or when the session is over and uh, there is just nothing. <laughs> There's no applause, no, there is no way to show the appreciation to the author. And uh, this, I think the, the platforms will need to develop some sort of applause things. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, I, I didn't actually think about the kind of appreciation to to the speaker. I was kind of thinking more of with the when a session ends, then uh, sometimes you're like, oh, it ended. OK, am I going to have a coffee by myself now? So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I think the uh, kind of applause is certainly um, Im important, I think, for yeah, just... online sessions. Yeah, but I think I think we have a lot of people actually working behind the scenes, for example, in the technological aspect. So I think we, we, we should tell them, uh, you know, we, we need some kind of applause at the end, uh, even like record an applause or something. But yeah, yeah, very, very interesting, very interesting. So um, what do you think about that? The FEMS Online Conference of Macroology? I'm very fond of this conference. I think it's a great idea that uh, FEMS actually uh, embrace the idea of having a larger but more regionally oriented conferences in the years between the really large uh, main FEMS meeting. I think great idea, pity in a way that uh, we got into the pandemic, but there you go. So again, on the online aspect or perhaps regarding to many of our attendees today, uh, because I know that um, many people that are attending this conference are going to be uh, early career scientists. So they, they are just starting their scientific career. What, what is your piece of advice to them? Perhaps something you wanted to receive when you were just starting your career because uh, you're an established scientist now. So what are a few words that you can say to them? Well, in a way, it's, um, it's uh, difficult to say, to give uh, some advices because the things have changed so much since I personally or my generation mm -hmm. started science. And uh, for instance, in our uh, microbiological society, national, we are often discussing these uh, issues. Uh, let me give you an example. When we started our career in science, then uh, the, there was really a, a lack of information and we were really hungry for the information and we were happy to go to the meetings and happy to go to work in uh, the laboratories uh, outside and we were happy of any lecture that was happening and nowadays this is quite contrary there is too much of everything mm -hmm. and so the young people really have to choose very carefully and uh, sometimes you really have to almost plead them to use the grants to go outside so my my advice I would actually like to say two things. One is that most interesting results are the wrong ones. Mm -hmm. Those that doesn't fit into your scheme, those that you didn't expect, but they keep coming back and they keep coming back and you're all frustrated because you think your experiments don't move anywhere. But those are actually the new things and the interesting things. So, um, be happy when you get unexpected wrong results and um, the other thing i think hard work is important but hard work is only one third of the story so another third is just pure luck mm -hmm. you have to be lucky and uh, a very important third is networking nowadays everything is about networking 
And this is my advice, really. Make sure that you somehow incorporate all three of them. Yeah, so it's very important, I think, in these days as well, just not to focus on only one aspect of uh, uh, your career. So it's uh, it's hard work, it's networking, it's uh, what you do after work. So investing in uh, in yourself, going out and uh, exercising. So it's not just one aspect. So it's pretty important to give equal attention to all the small little things that uh, are part of our daily lives and ultimately um if you kind of master all those things then uh, it will really really show you and push you in instead of pulling yourself to like oh i have to i have to have results i have to make this uh, i don't know pcr work so <laughs> <laughs> perhaps like being yes. in, a, in a nice happy place then it will push everything to kind of align to where where are they supposed to be, perhaps? Yeah, this is another nice part of the science, isn't it? That you can uh, also a little bit jungle with your daily schedule. And sometimes it's more towards the science and sometimes it's more towards other priorities. So um, it's nice to have a job that is not nine to five. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think most of us basically goes into the other direction that we stretch the scientific part more and more and more. So, but on the other hand, I, I don't uh, think that the young generations nowadays really have a problem with it. I think the young generation is very, very good in, um, in handling this uh, life work balance. Sometimes the supervisors think that even too well. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's interesting to see uh, what um, perhaps the, the early young career scientist thinks and what the supervisor thinks. It's uh, pretty interesting to kind of have the two people together. Again, in this kind of um, area of research, again, uh, obviously, with a lot of local measures in the pandemics, a lot of us had to move entirely from working from home, but on a very positive note that um, we are going to return back normally into the labs or be able to maybe do half half the day in the lab and half the day working from home, perhaps. Um, I wanted to ask you a lab-related question. So um, for you, what is your favorite uh, laboratory techniques and what tips can you give us on how to master the technique? Before answering this one, um, I would just like to say that uh, at my stage of career, I, uh, you don't spend a lot of time in the mm -hmm. lab anymore. It's more like uh, the office work and uh, management. And all my attempts to spend some time in the lab ended very poorly. So I have given this up, but uh, I do have my favorite technique. It has actually changed during mm -hmm. the years. And in my uh, early uh, stages of the career, I was all molecular. Mm -hmm. So I was really pro molecular things. And everything that was anyhow molecular was great. And now I have completely shifted. And uh, now the culture ring is my favorite technique. And uh, I just like to see bacteria growing. And uh, I like to get find them in all these strange environments. And then once you have the strains, then you can do a lot of things with them, you know, and see the interactions and uh, you just get them know in a different light, in different aspect. So um, I think, you know, the, the culturing is the classics of microbiology mm -hmm. and classic yeah, stays. Yeah. So. If we go back to the question, maybe perhaps someone or an early career scientist or even later on in your career, you might not have even done culturing and sometimes you have to uh, try and do it for the first time. So what is a piece of advice that you can give to uh, those people starting in a new technique perhaps for the first time? Yeah, but uh, when starting a new technique or a new project, even 
then um, I think it's very important to to get the right balance between the theory and mm. praxis. We sometimes uh, made a mistake to to spend too much la uh, uh, time in the lab and uh, just trying to find out everything by ourselves. And at the beginning, it's worth to spend a little bit of time just looking at the literature, but again, not too much because very quickly you need to go and try your own things and then again go back to the literature and so, you know, just shifting uh, here and there. You know, we are different. Some people are, are very uh, happy to try always something new and something new. And on the other side, we have uh, those people that are more feeling more secure when they know one technique very well and then they apply it to different uh, problems uh, and both things are actually uh, both things are actually uh, yeah, okay yeah that's actually really true i think always it's very good to understand the literature and how something works and then perhaps going and trying it out and figuring out how to do it so yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's, it's important to and know that's... the uh, how a technique works, also to help us interpret the results as well. Yeah, and that's why that's why uh, networking is so important, and also your your work environment is important, and it's nice if it is very diverse, so that you have very direct access to different mm. techniques and to people that are really good at it. Not everyone has this uh, has this possibility. In this case, you know, you just have to find your way. And sometimes it's uh, it's not so bad to have uh, a little bit limited funds because then you invest more into mm. thinking, and then you come to maybe uh, very novel and new solutions. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's interesting. Yeah. For the last question I have for you today, I wanted to ask if you have worked with um, many different pathogens throughout your career, or was it just um, you you focus in one? Because that's different with um, different people. So some people start from investigating one, and then their career just takes them into a new pathogen. But perhaps uh, you worked on mm -hmm. only one. What is uh, what happened in your case? <laughs> <laughs> this is actually the case. Yes, I started my uh, PhD with uh, Clostridium difficile and uh, this was in early 90s. So you can calculate how far away this was. And since, since then it was always Clostridium difficile. That's why I'm, I don't want to adopt, it's very hard for me to adopt the new name, Clostridioides yeah. difficile. There is actually a funny story about this. I was uh, at the days, those days when we were still traveling, you know, and even when we were traveling and uh, talking to each other on the flights, for instance, not spending the time on your uh, mobiles, uh, I was sitting next to somebody and we started to talk and, you know, the obvious conversation. So what are you doing? What are you doing? And he was in the fruit juices and I said, oh, I'm in microbiology. Oh, what in microbiology? Because he knew a little bit of it because of the fruit juices and spoilage. And I said, oh, I'm working with this one bacterium, you know, Clostridium difficile. Ah, okay. And how long have you been working with it? I said, well, about 20 years. So, <laughs> What? 20 years with one tiny little bacterium. I would understand if you would work with the elephant for 20 years because it's big, you know, but no one little thing. And I said, yes, but you know, it's, uh, this is the center, but you actually use many different uh, techniques and you have many different questions and you are moving from many different uh, aspects, but it's always about this one bacterium. So yeah, yeah, funny enough, you can spend more than 20 years with one bug. But recently we, we moved basically because C. diff is uh, associated with disturbed mm -hmm. microbiota. Uh, we started with uh, microbiota and now we are slowly, slowly shifting. Right now we are equal, CD and microbiota, and we'll see in which way we will go yeah, further. What, what, what uh, aspect of uh, 
So if you find fascinating, I guess, starting working with a bacterium, then not knowing anything about it, and then you start investigating more. So what, what is the one thing that stayed with you, like the most interesting thing about CDF? Uh, the most interesting thing is that um, whatever you look at with Clostridium difficile, there is uh, there is always a new something new and a new mechanism and uh, something unknown. And uh, right now, the very new thing is that we have the possibility to really look at the uh, speciation. So how how this entire spectrum of the strains exists, and we can really follow how this, or we are starting to understand how this very important human pathogen actually developed from the soil Clostridia. So we are very um, excited about this. And uh, a lot of groups at all continents are seeing the same thing now. Yeah, that's 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 very interesting as well. Um, so that was uh, the last question I had for you uh, today. Uh, I just want again to thank you for taking the time to be with me during the interview and giving your talk later today. Yeah. And thank to you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Um, thank you. And then one last thing before ending this uh, this session. Um, just as a reminder, uh, Professor Maya is going to be speaking on session four, Microbiomes and Human Health at 25 past four about C. diff and One Health. So thank you and uh, I'm looking forward to hear your talk. Thank Bye you. Bye-bye everybody.